The Working Artist Project is brought to you by Second Line Arts Collective. Learn how you can support at secondlinearts.org. We're creating a platform for those who are curious. One that tells the story from the artist's perspective. Moments in time, captured from the innovators who are reshaping dance, music, theater, and the visual arts. This is The Working Artist Project. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to The Working Artist Project. Uh, tonight's guest is the wonderful, the amazing, the magnanimous. Is that the right word, Greg? <laughs> But this guy, yeah, magnanimous is definitely the word for him. <laughs> Roderick Paulin. And uh, Rod Roderick, it, it, for me, I know at least for me, I met him in Delphio's band, and, and he was like that guy who always helped you, you know, know the truth. You know, it was that all, is, it's, it was always clear. certainly one way of putting it, without a doubt. <laughs> Roger, Roderick is full of truth. Uh, Roderick is one of the most incredible musicians, saxophone players that I have ever met. And he's one of the few cats that when I leave New Orleans and I start listening to um, a whole heap of tenor players, at some point of my, at some point, I tell myself, man, what I would do to listen to Roderick Paulin right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Roderick, what's up, man? How you doing? Man, y'all, y'all already know what it is, man. I'm glad <laughs> to be here with y'all today, fellas. How y'all doing, man? Glad to be here. Doing, so doing good. good. Doing good. Good. Yeah, man, it's good. It's good to be here with you. It's good to see you. It's been quite a while. Yeah, man, it's been uh, it's been it's been a minute, especially with all everything that's going on, man. You know, so uh, but again, congrats on on your baby girl, man. Thank you, you know, yeah. Man, thank you. Yeah, I'm trying to I'm trying to get it together over here. I'm the I'm the uh, the diaper changing king. Can't nobody yep. me on a diaper. Yep. Wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> An undisputed diaper changing king. You, are you still the Uno champion, or are you oh, the yeah, diaper king now? <laughs> all, all, all of the above. All of the above. Absolutely. Yeah, man, Roderick. So I want to get right into things, man. And um, for those who don't know, Roderick, uh, you about to get to know him right now. Yeah. And you, you come from one of those famous New Orleans music families, and it's funny to say it like that because I'm always telling my wife about all of these music families. And so you, you come from, your, your dad was a musician, and uh, I'm gonna let you tell the people what's going on with that. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, well, you know, uh, you know, New Orleans is, 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 uh, is has a, a lot of musical families. My family, the Andrews family, Marcellus's, and the list just goes on and on. Uh, but my family, the Paulin family, my dad was a, uh, was a band leader and was served as like an incubator, so to speak, for a lot of cats back in the day such as Greg Stafford, Michael White, uh, Tuba Fats, Donald Harrison. Wow. Uh, so yeah, man, I mean, and, and it was a great experience to kind of grow up and, and see that, uh, see all those cats. And I wasn't even playing. I can remember uh, they would congregate at my dad's house and, you know, my dad, they would, you know, cats just hanging and talking before the gig. And, you know, and sometimes I would go and, and just being immersed in it and being around that kind of energy, uh, you know, help shape me into who I was and until I started playing years later and whatnot. So, uh, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's a great experience. You know, I was, uh, I'm the youngest, uh, my mother and father, they had 13 children and six, 10, 10 boys, three girls and six of the sons played my, my, uh, my two sisters. I had one sister that played flute, another one played piano. So, you know, music was like a constant you know, like most families and musical families in the world. So, I mean, it was always a thing, you know, so. Yeah. But really, honestly and truly, I wanted to be an airline pilot. I really <laughs> did. I wanted to be a pilot. I really did. I used to go and watch the uh, the planes take off at the Lakefront Airport when I was young, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. But, you know, I got so involved into the music. It's like going out into the ocean mm -hmm. and it's like you just, every way you turn around, there's water. So it's too late now. I'm in too deep. So <laughs> that's right. Yeah, you, <laughs> um, that's, can you tell what's your earliest musical memory? Like, I mean, coming from a musical family, you must. I mean, again, interacting with all these who's who of musicians and, and cats like that. What, um, what's the first musical thing that pops into your head when you when you think about you as a young person? Um, um, 
uh, it goes back, I would say 1979. I was in sixth grade and it was Mardi Gras day and Mardi Gras day, of course, you know, everything's a lot of parades and whatnot. So the saxophone player uh, that my dad had hired to make the gig, he couldn't make the gig at the last minute. So I, at that song, at that time, I think I knew when the saints go marching in just a closer walk with thee and by and by. And those three songs, I'm not even sure if I knew them 100%. So my dad woke me up like about 4.30 in the morning. And he said, get up, get dressed. Let's go. And I'm saying, go where? <laughs> and he's like, look, you got to come make this gig, man. So I'm in sixth grade. So I'm listening and playing the gig. And, uh, and, I'm, just, and I'm just feeling it. And my dad said, he said, look, whatever you don't know, don't play. <laughs> but listen to them and learn the form of the tongue. And that's what he did. So, and of course, the greatest thing was, is at the end of the gig, he paid me money. I said, yeah, I could <laughs> probably do this. So, so here it is, I'm in sixth grade and I'm getting paid even back then, just like maybe $150. That was a lot of money back then. So I just put two and two together. I said, yeah, I better get to practicing. So uh, <laughs> that's the same. We're getting paid for gigs these days. <laughs> see, see that? See, see. <laughs> must be rich back in the day. Right. Man, look, bro. Oh my God. So, so yeah, and that's just one of many experiences, man. I mean, um, you know, and that's what makes New Orleans so great and so attractive to people around the world. They want to come here. They want to have these experiences because. Uh, it's genuine, you know what I'm saying? So, I mean, Absolutely. yeah. Absolutely. Now, how do you, how do you like internalize and carry on that legacy, the legacy of your father, the legacy of your mother? Cause your mother was a musician, musician also, and maybe your grandparents were too, I don't know, but how do you, how do you carry that legacy? Well, I, I just kind of, you know, I, I just really do it because I mean, playing coming from the, from the brass band idiom, uh, growing up in church, playing church, uh, bass hymns and whatnot. I just kind of take all of it and, and I just try to make sense of it in the moment, so to speak. And of course, I couple that with all of the other experiences I had with some of the other uh, bands in the city, uh, such as the Dirty Dozen, the Rebirth Brass Band and, and others. And, and even right now, present day 2020, I still call upon those things that, that has helped me over the years uh, of course, I was always the youngest one on gigs. Now that's not the case. Now I'm I'm the older one right now. So, uh, so what 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 inspires me to keep going is to still be able to 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 con to contribute to the music, and because everything that I do is a is representative not only of my biological family but all of the other cats that played New Orleans music as well. So that's the thing that inspires me to just keep getting better because every time somebody hears me, or I'm able to talk about it. That talks about my mother, that talks about my father, my brothers, all of the other cats from years ago, you know what I'm saying? That played and is playing this New Orleans music because I am a direct product. I am a direct product of New Orleans music. So I, and that's what I'm, I'm proud. I'm proud of that. It, it, it has afforded me a really good life. It still is. So, uh, you know, yeah, it's cool as a fan. Uh, I'm Darren. I, I really love it, man. I, what do you think about people like me who came to New Orleans and was trying to learn your music from you and then take it out of New Orleans or some people keep it in New Orleans? Like, how do you feel about those people coming into the city and trying to learn the music and play it? Well, you know, it's, 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 it's a funny dynamic because one, New Orleans is a tourist town. That's one, first and foremost. And beside it being a tourist town, the reason that it is a tourist town is for two main reasons. One, the culture. Mm -hmm. Two, the music. So the, the musicians such as yourself and other musicians have been coming to New Orleans for decades and learning and assimilating to the culture and to the life. And there's nothing that you know, on, on some level, there is an argument or, or, or a few statements that, that some believe that 
some people are coming in and taking, so to speak, or siphoning off of the culture. Well, we could, we could say that, but the only thing that we can do is do our part. And musicians such as yourself, that's why when people come, any interactions that I try to have with musicians that may not be from here, a lot of times what they miss is not so much about the music. It's not about the, it's about the people. You got to get to know who the people are because the people internalize where they are, who we are, what we do in New Orleans, and that comes through the music. So, I mean, you can learn the music, and that's what I tell people all the time, you can learn the music, but until you start learning the people, talk to the people, find out who they are, that's gonna help you identify with what's happening with the music. Hmm. That, that's yeah. so interesting too, because like, again, the, the word social music, and I, think, you know, I know Jonathan Baptiste has been throwing that around a lot with his band, but New Orleans is without a doubt the epitome of the idea of social music. And it's always, it always blows my mind, like hearing young cats come to New Orleans and, and they can play the music, they're playing all the right, the right notes, but exactly what you're saying is they're missing the social aspect of what it means to be from New Orleans, what it means to live like you're from New Orleans and, yeah. and, 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 and do all of those things that they, we kind of take for granted from, you know, from being here and living here. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. You know, and, and, and the other thing on the heels of that, Greg, is like, like for example, Let's talk about the musicians in Jackson Square. Mm. The cats that play in Jackson Square, they may not be the most technically sound, they may not be the most technically sound, sound or sound you know, musicians, but what they play is honest. Mm -hmm. If they play in a whole note, you can bet you can bet your bottom dollar. That is the most sincere whole note that you're probably going to hear. And again, that's, and, 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 and I think that we're, we're talking about uh, respect now, because what happens a lot of times in some music schools, so much attention is focused on the notes and the phrases. And yes, those are important. But at the end of the day, besides the music, we got to get back to people because you got to make a connection with people. The cats in Jackson Square, they make a connection with people. And that's why they come from all over the world. And you'd be surprised. People on the street are making a living of forty to fifty, some sixty thousand dollars playing on the street. So that is to be respected. And I think what happens a lot of times, particularly in New Orleans, is that that's kind of looked down upon. It's like, well, you have to go to school. School is not going to teach you how to play. End of discussion. School is going to give you the tools. Now, once you get out of school, then you have to apply everything that you've made. Because people don't care about the notes and the phrases. They want to know, can I feel something? Yep. And is it genuine? So to try to have that dichotomy of between the two, that's kind of what I tried to do all of my life because that's where I come from. So, I mean, you know. It just reminds me, I was in Ascona, Switzerland one year. And, and be before, even before that, I'm in New Orleans following hurling around. Every gig I show up, hey, Mr. Riley, it's me again. And you know, I'm like, hey, I want you to teach me how to do X, Y. I always had something for him to teach me to do with no mm -hmm. money to pay him to teach me to do it. <laughs> and, and I remember we finally just, you know, this is happening over a year or two. And then we get to Ascona and he, he just walked to me. So he would listen to me playing. He just walked to, to, to me and said, if you don't learn the culture of New Orleans then you can never play this music. And that's all he said. And I was like, oh shit, okay. So what does that mean? Like, oh, I gotta learn the culture. And so I think that's exactly what you're saying. Like this is the people, it's the culture, it's the food, you know, it's, it's yeah. all of that. It's just not notes on a page or rhythms. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and, and like I said, that's to, uh, that's so important because I, you know, I am a definite, uh, a supporter of education. I believe that we all, you know, the education in schools because school serves a purpose too. So, you know, the, you know, it's sometimes it's like an us against them, like school, school cats, those who go to school and those who teach school versus guys that are really out here doing it. And sometimes they come together and say, oh, we're doing this. We're doing that. I think that the two can come together and that way we can help foster the next generation of musicians that are really knowledgeable about the music, about the culture and not just about in New Orleans, we're talking about all over the globe. 
I mean, people have taken uh, music, New Orleans music as well, and just made it shareable and linked it with people because people liked it. So how can, you know, so, so being able to, for, for, for students now that are in music schools, you've got to learn your mechanics. You have to learn that. If you want to get better, there's no, but you have to demand that, that sort of thing, that sort of discipline from yourself. So, I mean, it's, uh, it, it is in fact a lot of work because a lot of times what we do as musicians, unfortunately, sometimes is bastardized sometimes, but that's not, that's not the whole idea of what music is. Some people will look at uh, New Orleans music, for example. They will look at some people and think that that's New Orleans music. No, sir, you're confused. That's not what it is. Wow. You're, you may be talking to some other kind of people, but New Orleans music is fun, it's swing, it's trad, it's people with integrity, hmm. it's people that are professional. Now, of course, we're having fun, but don't get it twisted neither. We doing work. Yeah. Oh, New Orleans music is, uh, oh, I can play New Orleans music. Uh, okay. <laughs> All right. And that, 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 like everything that you just said is, is something that I really admire about you as a person and also as a musician, because I feel like you, um, something that makes you so special as a musician is that you embody all aspects of New Orleans from what you were saying, Jackson Square, the brass band traditions, and, and really the, the, the people in the community. But, but you also are extremely academic. You are totally like within the institution. You, you, you're like a chameleon in that way where you can, you can do so many things and, and you have spent time in the classroom as a teacher. You're currently working on your master's and, and, and that's something that always, when I, when I hear you play, it's just this, there's a, a certain honesty and ability and, and how, how did you, um, how are you able to like shred on some modal jazz and then also like play like the most beautiful solo over like Paul Barbarant's second line or something like what well, do those things have in common and like, how do you, how do you live in both of those spaces at the same time? I can tell you this, the, uh, it was 1984. Uh, well, the start of that, I would say, Greg, is 1984. I was, I was in 10th grade. I was at NOCA. Ellis Marcellus was over the jazz department at NOCA. And I was learning Charlie Parker, John Coltrane, all of that stuff. So that's what I was doing in school. Of course, you know, you go to school half day, then you go to NOCA in the afternoon. Well, I was learning all these things over the course of the year. And of course, I'm still performing with my, in my father's, you know, traditional brass band. And my father, uh, you know, of course, uh, it was traditional brass band. So I went on his gig. We're playing Paul Barber and we have to play the gig. And I'm playing Coltrane. I'm playing Sonny Stitt or trying to Charlie Parker, John Coltrane. And my dad used to have this big calendar up on the wall. And it had all of the gigs that was happening for the month. So I'm living at home. Of course, I'm in 10th grade. I'm looking at these gigs. I'm saying, okay, yeah. So I get dressed for the gig, black and white. I get my instrument. I'm going out to the car. My dad asked me, he says, where are you going? <laughs> well, I thought, he says, you haven't learned how to play the gig. And for six months, my father didn't hire me. Wow. So guess what? I learned how to play the blues. If the gig was the blues, you play the blues. If the gig is trad, you play trad. If the gig is big band, you play big band. And see, this is ain't in no book. So trust me, and I'm in 10th grade. So when he did hire me again, guess what? I learned how to play New Orleans traditional music really quickly. Absolutely. Trust me. Absolutely. And he didn't have to raise his voice above a whisper. He just told, and I, he, I, and I tried to get my mom involved. I said, my, my mother said, nope, obviously you was doing something you had no business doing on a gig. So he didn't hire me for six months. So I learned how to play the gig in 10th grade. <laughs> hmm. That's an invaluable lesson. And I think it transcends music, you know? Of course, yeah. If somebody absolutely. hires you to put a roof on a house, put the roof on a house and don't mess with the foundation. <laughs> it's, yeah. It's really just that simple, you know? Yeah. So, <laughs> do no job <laughs> look man people i didn't notice about you but i was reading up on you studying about you and, and i and i learned that you were the rebirth brass band like oh yeah how did that and you were for many years you were in the band and eventually you you decided to to do something else how did that whole thing come about oh man look the rebirth brass band was the was the band that really let me 
you introduce me to people, how to make people feel good. And because keep in mind, I'm coming from opposite ends of the extreme. And with my father, it was very traditional, church-based hymns, you know, black and white with the tie, with the hat, with the whole, the whole nine yards, because that's what, that we're, we are selling New Orleans music. On the other end, here was Rebirth. I was attending Southern at New Orleans, Suno. I came home from Southern Baton Rouge and was attending Suno, studying with Kid Jordan. And I met Philip Frazier, then the, the leader of the, of the, of the Rebirth Brass. He said, hey, bro, we was, in, we was in band class together, jazz band class. He said, say, bro, I want you to come make this gig. Uh, can you make this gig with us tonight at Tipitina? I said, OK. I'm totally green, had no idea what was happening. So I show up at Tipitina's at 10 o'clock in black and white, and these dudes show up, jeans, dress, or some, some really casual, and I instantly, I was sticking out like a sore thumb. But musically, I made the, I had to make the adjustment because I was playing alto at the time, and the gig went off fine, and uh, they said, say, bro, the, the alto is fine, but we need you in a lower voice. So I had to get me a tenor. So I went to the pawn shop the next day and bought me a tenor for like $225. Wow. And that's when I started my, that's when I started playing tenor with them. Wow. And those guys, it, it was, playing with those guys was absolutely wonderful. They, I, mean, was, I got to travel, got exposed to all kinds of things. Uh, that's when I started my writing opportunities because of uh, rebirth. You know what I'm saying? So it was, uh, we was traveling two, three hundred days a year, and I did that for a while. And I said I wanted to go back and finish my undergrad. So I kind of started stepping back and started going to school part time. You know what I'm saying? So, uh, but yeah, those guys taught me about intensity, and they taught me how to really, really make the music happen. And from a, from, from, from a harmonic standpoint, because the idea back, back then was that a lot of the bands harmonically was playing like, the, like, like one, the root, the third, and the fifth. So what I started doing, I started playing the seventh. Every, I, I always played from the fifth, the seventh, and the ninth. And what it did, it started, it started changing the color of the song. And they never heard that. So it was like, bro, what you doing? I'm like, I'm just playing, I'm just playing a line on the set. And it started really, the, the harmony started to being stretched. So I would tell the cats, look, play this note. I started, you know, telling them about 11 chords and 13 chords and start stretching the harmonies in a way that brass band music really had not been done while still keeping that intensity of the, uh, of the, of the, you know, of the rhythm section with that intensity. So I mean, it was really, really, it was really, really cool. I learned a lot about, you know, people writing music and uh, uh, I learned the art of travel. We're talking non-musical things because trust me, <laughs> I learned the art of travel. I learned how to travel smart. Yeah. When you travel, you want to travel smart. You want to travel economically. Mm -hmm. I learned about the business, uh, about being paid well, having your having everything together with your BMI, so you can still get your checks every three months, which I still do, thank God. <laughs> so, I mean, the whole nine yards, man. I mean, it was totally, totally great, man. Man, right now, I want to kind of, I want to listen to some of your music and give the people who don't know you an opportunity to get to know you musically. And uh, I want to sure. start in the tradition because that's where we are now. And later on, we'll get into some of your, some of your other pursuits. Mm -hmm. And uh, so why don't we play um, Bogalusa Strut? Is that cool? Cool, yeah. Let's do it. <laughs> Thank you. 
Well, I think our, our sound cut off. Did he cut off for you, Roger? Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Hey, Amen. I'm over here going, hey, what's the matter, matter now? <laughs> 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 yeah, oh, man. That's awesome. Yo, man, just, just so killing. And, and unfortunately, I feel like we could spend days and, 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 and weeks talking about musically what you're doing and just really dig into that. But may, maybe this would be a good time to um, transition more into the, the business aspects of um, of your life and your career and something that i really admire about you particularly is again like the man just you're so deep rooted in 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 what it means to be from new orleans playing the you know music on such a high level i mean you're educated you are you're a hustler to the max but you got your business together and you're always preaching i mean you have some of the the the, the greatest sayings in the world and, and you're always harping on how important it is to get your business together. Yeah. Um, what what advice do you have for young musicians coming up, looking to make a career in the music, and and, and maybe not specifically about what notes to play on a C seven, mm -hmm. but like how do you how do you feed your kids and how do you keep a roof over your head and make it to rehearsal? <laughs> yeah, you know it's uh, you know it's any 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 business is is tough particularly the entertainment industry, because there is no retirement at the end of it. So that means that you have to have things set up as you progress in your career. So when you get to a certain point, let's say at 65, typically, which is the most looked at age in the United States for retirement, if you decide to go into the, the entertainment industry as a professional musician, you want to take a look at that. Just the numbers alone is, 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 is going to dictate that you have to have some other things set up. If, you're, if the gig is paying, let's say $100, take 30% off. Take 30% off the top. Every gig I do, I take 30% off the top, regardless as to what's happening. And I put that aside. I don't touch it. Uh, and sometimes I've always, had a, I've always had a day job as a teacher, uh, or I work for AT&T close to 20 years. So and still doing gigs at night because when I say that the hustle don't stop, it's really not uh, just a cliche of words. It's really true mm -hmm. because it doesn't stop. There is no such thing as extra money, particularly for a musician. So it's important for musicians to understand the dynamic of the business end of what we do. Because again, you can love the music and you can love the music, but at the end of the day, it's a business. And regardless as to what you do with the music, you don't want to find yourself in a position in your 50s or 60s looking for somebody else to do something for you because it's not going to happen nobody's going to nobody is coming to your rescue so musicians not only have to learn the music they have to make they have to make themselves aware of the business practices so they can be in a better financial position to go ahead and live a, and live a good life and if as musicians if we cannot have an intelligent adult conversation about the money i don't want to work with you plain and simple because what we're not going to do we're not going to argue about money if we're all we're i am not going to raise my voice above money i did that years ago and so now uh coming up in a business i've had other mentors and other older musicians that have told me the same thing you know and uh playing music and whatnot and of course in the music business everything is readily available at your disposal you have you know we're in the entertainment anyway we have food we have drinks 
and, and all of those different uh, kinds of things. And that's good. You should enjoy yourself. However, remember, at the end of the day, you're getting older. You're not going to do you're not going to be able to do the things at 50 that you used to do at 25. And that's mm -hmm. from a number standpoint. So how do you how do you uh, 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 move forward in your career financially? if you don't have a plan and you, if you have to have a plan, it's got to be detailed and leaving it to hope and chance is not a plan. And that's not, that's not a, um, that's not a judgment. That's just what it is. So studying music, study the economics, study your craft. If you want to get paid more as a musician, go home and practice. So when somebody comes to you, if they want you, if they want a really good clarinetist, I know that I, have to be on top. If you want me to play a certain kind of way, that means I have to be paid. I have to be compensated in such a way that warrants me asking for the a price that's higher than the norm. Some party planners, they actually, they actually, they actually thrive on that. Uh, I, I tell musicians all the time. Sometimes, you know, they're always looking for the cheaper musicians. Well, let me tell you something. Cheap is expensive. Sure, you can go get a musician. That may be cheap, but they may not show up on time, particularly in a hotel where you have clients and conventions. They want the New Orleans experience, but they also want professionalism. They want you to show up on time, do the job. And I've, and I've been there, done that. And everybody has a story, man. So, you know, I mean, we just have to continually make the economic portion of what we do a part of what we do every day besides the music. Yeah, man, that's, those are all really... I mean, people should be paying you for what you just said. And, and the, the crazy part about everything that you just said, there is no uh, structure for, for that education in university, in high school, in elementary, mm -hmm. just basics, basic economics. Yeah. You know what I mean? If I get paid 100 bucks, Uncle Sam, he needs 10%. And then you got to figure out how you're going to save another at least 10% on top of that for retirement. And then you got to know where to put it. Do you put it in a Roth IRA, a, a SEP, a IRA? Like you got to figure out, okay, how do I set myself up for retirement and how much, you know, it's so many little things like that that for personally I had to read books after college. Like, wait, how does this work? Because no, right. one, no one told me in college. And when I asked anything about money, clinicians and teachers would change the subject because guess what? They didn't know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and, and so my, you know, my message right now is why can't we talk about the economic portion of our business? See, the economics is taboo in this business. If you talk about that, well, then you're kind of labeled as not being cool. Oh, I thought we was cool. No, sir, we're going to be cool because we're going to have an intelligent conversation about the money. And again, if there is some sort of a rift about that, well, then that may need, I may not want to do business with you because there's some other kind of funny business that could happen. We don't want that. Those are kind of things that's not talked about in the, in the music business. And it needs to be because I have made those errors. Mm -hmm. I'm not just talking this. I lived this. So I now know what to do and how to do it. And like, like a gig, the only way you learn, learn to play the song better is you got to practice. So not only talking about the music, we also got to take care of our physical because if we're not physically well, we're not going to be able to do this work. You got cats that are taking pills at, at 55, 60 years old. You didn't get like that taking a pill. Again, this is no judgment. This is just, it is what it was. If you want to be able to continue to do this music, you can do it well into your 80s and 90s, but you got to be physically able to do it. So you may have to watch. You may not be able to drink as much. You may not be able to smoke as much. Again, that's, that's just uh, an outsider looking in. You do what you do, and it's cool. However, if you get sick, you don't have no retirement. You don't have any Medicaid or Medicare. How are you going to get that taken care of? Because the, rea the world of reality is everything costs money. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> Everything costs money. <laughs> And that's 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 such a you know, even today I had to I had to come up with a number for a project and like it was like gut wrenching for me to like think of like how much money I felt was correct and right for this project and and that's something that like I think as musicians like we again what Darian is saying is we get we get so ingrained in these myths and and 
us wanting to be authentic artists and being true to the craft and, and paying tribute to the, the masters before us and things yeah. of that sort that then when someone is like, yo, like I need you to make this gig a suit here at the Ritz Carlton and it pays $85 for three hours. Can you make it? And you're just like, I love the music. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and 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 I think that's something like what what you said is like the reason why, you know, for all the young musicians out there watching, you got to keep your body in shape. You have to take care of your finances. You got to make sure all those things, all those ducks are in order because you love the music and because you want to keep playing when you're 45, 55, 65, 75. Yeah, because as we get older, it gets more and more difficult to yeah, you know, just up and leave the house for a twenty five dollar gig wherever it is yeah. listen roger you know i was thinking about this a lot due to coronavirus and, and we're we're at a, a tipping point with the virus now where things are opening up and mm -hmm. opportunities again to play in clubs and i think as musicians and you can tell me what you think about this uh we have to remember that the club owner doesn't have our best interest at heart as far as health goes mm -hmm. just because the club is open doesn't mean that it's time for us to go play there. And also, there should be a coronavirus tax. It's not less, it doesn't cost the same for me to play in a more precarious situation. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like, I, you yeah. work at, at AT&T, the dudes who climbed the pole probably got paid the most. Yeah, we did. So, <laughs> the cat in the office, he typing, that's easy. So, so, I mean, I'm just saying, if we're gonna go out here and play in a club with 30, 40, 100 people, and at risk our lives, then we need that compensation. You tell me what you think about it. Well, you know, you know, Darren, that's a that's a that's a very uh, for some it, it it definitely for New Orleans and you know musicians across the globe, but definitely in the United States, it's a very touchy subject. But it's it's one I think that needs to be had. And my personal view is, I would not want to go and play in a lot of clubs right now because of that. And, and just because, let me also say, just because I'm an older, I'm older, uh, and, and everybody's situation is completely different, that does not make me uh, totally not affected by the pandemic and our business, because our business is still worked on, it's, it's about people and making a connection with people. And to the club owners, some club owners get it. Some club owners, the, the, uh, the num they don't have the numbers as they, as they did pre-COVID. So some clubs are not gonna be able to pay what they was paying pre-COVID. Now, what I will say is this, I think that us as musicians, we are in a very good position to really dictate and demand a better pay, such as what you alluded to. Because the reality is with everything that's happening, people want live music. That's good. Not only do they want live music, let me stress they want good live music. So now we're going into the area of quality in terms of musicians. This is no hate. If you want to be good, you got to go get on your axe and share it. If you want to sound good and want to be with that, because I think we owe it not only to the, the music, but we owe it to ourselves to keep pushing it so we can be in a position to get better pay. Now, that is a slippery slope. It's, it's, it's something that's been going on since uh, for, for decades in terms of musicians wanting to get paid. So I think, like I said, everybody's situation is, is completely different. Now, you are going to have some that are going to go do the gigs. And, and there's nothing we can do, unfortunately, to stop them from doing that. Un but when people come to, when people want quality, they know who to call and they know that they're going to have to pay. And this is not so much about money, but because, let's, as Greg said a, a minute ago, we want to be able to have, or should I say, we want to not have the gut-wrenching feeling about, about our, our being compensated what is a fair price. Now, what is fair is, you know, I mean, that, that, that has ebbs and flows. So I think we have to play it by ear and, and just recognize what you what what worth you bring to the table because if you've been practicing on your instrument all your life and somebody's going to call you and to make a gig for for eighty five dollars at the Ritz Carlton, hopefully we can be in a position to say, no, nah, I'm not going to be able to do that. I need X amount of dollars because 
you, the, the time that you have dedicated to your craft and to your instrument dictates that. Oh man, what are we gonna have a good time? No, I don't wanna have a good time. I need to get paid. End of discussion. Absolutely. Yeah, that, that's so important, man. And, and um, just, you know, something that I really admire about you is you have this unrelenting drive <laughs> and you have this, this desire to always, you know, attain information, whether it be shedding or, you know, your, your work, you know, I know that you, you studied law at some point and yeah. like, arranging and all this kind of stuff. And, and just maybe if uh, you wouldn't mind telling us how you're spending your time these days mm. and also what motivates you to like always be pushing so hard. Well, the, 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 the one person uh, that really motivates me is my mother. My mother is 93 years old. My mother is the unsung hero of my family and for me. I mean, to be 93 years old, she's still doing it. And every time I see her, she tells, she tells me, Roderick, keep pushing it. So there are some things that my mom, you know, wanted to do. And, and, and not only my mom, but our ancestors, they weren't able to do certain things. So I look at that as motivation for me every day to keep on pushing it. And that's why it's, a, uh, it's important to find out the thing that you love to do because what you, what you love to do, it's not work. So I love music. I wanna be involved in every aspect of it, no matter what the style is, if it's some young people, some older people. And that's the thing that, that I love to do. I, I love playing music. I wanna play with people that are better than me. I, wanna be, I want to be pushed. And I think it's, it's important for us to keep pushing in that way because that's what New Orleans is about. If New Orleans music is all that people think that it is, it's, it, that's not by chance. People have sacrificed, people are studying their instruments, the, you know, uh, musical icons that have passed on, that just didn't happen overnight. They, they, they continue to push it. So that's the thing that really drives me and especially as I get older. And the other thing is, as I get older, there's gonna be some things that I am not going to be able to do. And right now I'm just having a great time doing it. Um, I'm back in school right now at LSU pursuing my master's in jazz studies. And I'm the oldest one in all of my classes right now. It's like, well, why are you coming back to school, man? Because I need to learn something. I'm, 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 I'm studying with my saxophone instructor, I'm learning different approaches to different types of music that I that that maybe I may have heard over in the years, but I didn't know the idea behind how to make it work from a from a technical standpoint or for or, or from uh, a musical concept. So so that's what I'm doing um, right now. I'm um, I've I've really taken up the clarinet. I am not a clarinetist, but the last two years I have really, really heard where I wanted to be in uh, be at on that instrument. So I'm really putting in a lot of time with that uh, because I think New Orleans is a clarinet and a trumpet town too. So also with that in mind, I've really been checking out Sidney Bechet. He was a great uh, soprano saxophonist as we all know, but he was an absolutely monster clarinetist. So that's one of the things. So I, so I talked to you, Greg, I talked to Tim Laughlin, uh, I hit up Evan Christopher about mouthpiece, mouthpieces and different things like that. So I want to just keep on pushing it because when I get to the point where I'm not able to play, I want to say I've done all that I can do and I'm done. Hmm. So maybe I may go, I don't know, zip lining an Amazon or something like that. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, man, we, 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 um, we're coming to the end here, man. Yeah. And, uh, as we are, I do want to give you an opportunity to kind of, you know, promote your things, give the people the links and, and tell them how they can connect with you. Oh, well, you can catch me on social media. Uh, uh, you can catch me on Facebook, on Twitter, Instagram, Roderick Paulin, the Reverend. Um, uh, the, the, you know, one of the things I'm doing is, uh, is, is it's just, just I'm attempting to really just trying to move forward, really, uh, honestly. I mean, like I said, with, with school taking up a lot of my time, especially within a within a pandemic, right now, that's kind of one of the one of the things, uh, one of the most important things that I'm working on. But the other thing I want to let musicians know is really understand, take care of your mental, more than the music. I don't care if you I don't care if you're the most killing player. Take care of that mental, because if if the mental is not right, 
the mental affects everything, meaning being able to see different perspectives. Study that, you know, go and uh, uh, get a, a, a talk to somebody, a therapist. Nothing is wrong with that. Uh, mental therapy is just like a gig. You take lessons, you take, you take lessons. So you need to go uh, talk with somebody, a professional that can have you or maybe give you some tips so you can learn how to deal with your mental a lot better. And trust me, it's going to make a world of difference in your life. It's going to, because a lot of people are suffering mentally through this pandemic, man. You know, you know, it, it's totally unheard of. It's not talked about a lot, but people that are suffering, you know, they got some sort of mental things that's happening because they may not be able to deal with this from a financial standpoint or from a psychological standpoint. And then sometimes people need to just talk to people, man, and, and say, look, I'm dealing with this. They don't need to feel like they're on an island by themselves because if we are saying that we all that we have well then we need to be able to talk about that and encourage people in that way you know and and not make them feel that it's an issue to to be able to have that you know um, um, you know so that's that's a kind of like my thing man so but again i you know i really appreciate y'all the you know the opportunity to be able to be on this uh be on this with y'all man so you know uh I know sometimes uh, some of the things I said may have been uh, perceived as maybe hardcore, but the only thing is I, ch I just know what works in music. I mean, if our teachers weren't hardcore with us, how would we have gotten better? And I think that's what we're missing. We're, we've missed that somewhat in education across the board. Now, we're not talking about being disrespectful. No, but demanding more from your students. If you're not demanding more from yourself, how can we demand more from students? Wow. There it is, man. I don't know if there's anything else to say after all that. <laughs> man, let me say, I have spent many years on, on the gig, on the bandstand with you and, and, and been on airplanes and, and such. I really appreciate all the time we get to hang and talk. And, and, and you know, when you were talking about mental health, you, you're always so forthcoming with, with cats in the band and, and young musicians and being upfront with letting them know how things are and being available and, and, and kind of, you know, not, not necessarily you're giving therapy on the bandstand or something yeah. like that, but, but you are. Yeah. And, and, and making cats aware of, you know, the, the, the bigger picture of life and in the con, you know, if learning life lessons through music. And, and I wanted to thank you for always being oh, that man. cat on the on the bandstand for me. And I know you're that cat for a lot of other other people. Oh man, thank. Look, look, Greg, look, Greg, I'm I'm so glad to do that. And Darren, look, uh, everything what I said, man. Look, I can I can say those things because you know I have been there myself. Trust me, this is not something I just read in the book. I have lived this. I've experienced that. I've went through that, and it doesn't make me better than anyone, but if I can share some knowledge with somebody and they can hopefully get something from it, I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm going to just give it away. That's it. I mean, that's, that's all I got. Some will, some won't, some do, some don't. That's the most profound thing I got fellas. So look, I'm good. So it's like, <laughs> let's keep it moving, you know? So listen, y'all, we want to thank y'all for tuning in to this episode of the working artist project. Yes, sir. And uh, if you want to know how you, you can support us to keep us going, you can head on over to our website, secondlinearts.org, and, uh, you know, hit that donate button 50 times. Absolutely. You know, we're, Absolutely. We out here trying to make it happen. But, uh, man, That's right. Roger. Thank you all so much, fellas. Thank you for having us. And uh, I'm Darian Douglas. My name is Gregory Ajid. Roger, thank you very much for everything. And uh, we're the Working Artist Project. Yeah. Absolutely. Thanks, y'all. Thank y'all so much, Greg, Darian. Much, much love and respect to y'all, fellas. Keep doing what y'all do, bro. We'll catch y'all later on the next one. For sure. You're right.